Dude, it's time for some more Nile Red. Specifically, this chemical really doesn't want to exist. There's plenty of stuff like that in nuclear engineering. Good use of a warning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. For at least a year now, I've been telling myself that I would make shorter videos. However, I would always just end up choosing much larger projects. And then while I was editing it, I'd be wondering why it was already 20 minutes long. <laughs> sure. Finally, though, I've committed to making some shorter ones like this video. And there are a whole bunch of different topics that I do eventually want to cover. But to start things off, I've decided to go with something called manganese heptoxide. Manganese heptoxide is nothing new, and it's been known to exist since at least the mid-1800s. It's made by mixing two relatively- Yeah, this one you wouldn't want to put in your nuclear plant. It's quite unstable. We like things stable in nuclear plants. This thing is highly corrosive and explosive, which is the antithesis of good water chemistry in your nuclear plant. Relatively common chemicals, where the first one is just concentrated sulfuric acid. I like to add a pipette full, which is about 2 milliliters, and then to sprinkle on a small amount of the second ingredient, which is potassium permanganate. This is not something you're going to want to scale up dramatically. <laughs> so yes, use very small amounts. The moment that they're mixed, the sulfuric acid reacts with the potassium permanganate to make permanganic acid. This acid is then dehydrated by the sulfuric acid, meaning a water is pulled off, and it forms an anhydride version. This new molecule is a combination of two permanganic acids, and it really doesn't want to exist. It's a really strong oxidizer, but it's also not very stable, so it basically looks for any reason to decompose. This can either be by reacting with something, or just spontaneously. Yeah, hence the warning. Super oxidizer will attack almost anything organic, unpredictable, and really unsuitable for any practical use because we want repeatable results, especially in nuclear power. For example, this was a different sample that I made using a lot more potassium permanganate, and all I did was touch it with a hot piece of metal. Yep. <laughs> all of the green oil at the top was the manganese heptoxide, and you can see that almost Makes immediately, it, it all reacted. However, when the amount of permanganate that's used is low, like I did for this first run, and when the temperature is below 55 C, you don't have to worry too much about it spontaneously decomposing. It's only really when you add quite a bit of it, and you get all of that oil floating on the top. Sure. Regardless of that though, it is still very dangerous, and it has to be treated with respect. But anyway- Yes, and that's the right attitude to have. Treating high energy systems, highly reactive systems with respect. That's probably one of the biggest lessons of working in a nuclear power plant is there's a lot of high energy systems. Now they're very, there's a lot of safeguards in place, redundant safety systems, um, such as the emergency core cooling system for the reactor, backup power supplies, such as emergency diesel generators, but it really comes down to treating the reactor with the respect that it deserves. You take care of it, it provides power for millions of homes. And I'm talking reliable baseload power, not intermittents that renewables have to deal with. But if you don't operate it safely, you have poor design and a poor safety culture, you get Chernobyl. Anyway, now getting back to this sample, for the first test, I just dropped a cotton ball on it. The reaction was quite fast, and it also generated a lot of heat, so it almost immediately lit on fire. Most of the heptoxide either reacted or decomposed almost instantly, though, so the violent part of the reaction didn't last very long. One thing that comes to mind when I think of elements that don't like to... When I think of things that really don't want to exist, I think of super heavy elements, such as agonessin or element 118. That thing is created in particle accelerators for a few milliseconds before it decays away. Kind of like, it's a different process, but kind of like the manganese heptopside, heptoxide. You can make it, but it immediately starts scheming on how it wants to disappear. There's a nuclear engineering joke that some elements are born dying. To quench this, I just added some water, which killed any remaining heptoxide and converted it back to the pinkish purple permanganic acid. 
There was also a bunch of brown stuff that appeared, Interesting. which was all manganese dioxide. Okay. For the next run, I did it with a potato chip, and it was mostly the oil in it that reacted. This time, though, for whatever reason, it let off a lot more manganese dioxide. Wow. I did it again from another angle, just to really show how much it was letting off. The chip didn't react nearly as much, but the effect was pretty much the same, which told me it was probably just the heptoxide decomposing. Sure. The manganese dioxide was initially With a really fine dust, chip. but once it was in the air for a bit, it started to form these small little pieces. All those little flakes, it's just surreal. They were still extremely light, but they were now too heavy to just float around in the air, so they all started falling back down. For the sake of the visuals, I turned off my fume hood for most runs, but I had to be really careful because breathing this stuff in wouldn't be very good to say the least. When yeah, I can't say at a nuclear plant you would ever turn off any of your equipment related to safety purely for the visuals, but <laughs> okay. When I turned the hood back on though, you can see how they all kind of just switched directions yeah. and got pulled away. For the next run, I added a lot more permanganate and there was a lot more heptoxide floating on the top. I assumed this would make the reaction even faster and more violent, so I threw on another cotton ball. However, it was actually more delayed, and I'm not entirely sure why. In general though, this heptoxide reaction seems to happen in two stages, where the first one is directly between the heptoxide and the cotton. This then generates enough heat to quickly decompose wow. the rest of the heptoxide. And in doing so, it splits apart into manganese dioxide like I mentioned before, as well as a whole bunch of oxygen and ozone gas. Both of these gases are then able to immediately react with the already burning cotton the and cause it to erupt in flames. The issue with this more concentrated run though, seems to be with the first part. The more pure heptoxide apparently just has trouble attacking and oxidizing the cotton on its own. In the other run, because I used less permanganate, there was more sulfuric acid present, and I think it helped in some way. Sulfuric acid reacts quite easily with cotton, and I think that maybe it helps speed up its reaction with the heptoxide. So after a nuclear reactor runs, you get fission products such as tellurium-135. Now that one isn't talked about very much in the concept of nuclear waste, even though that's a pretty common fission product for uranium-235. Here are the probability distribution twin peaked curves for fission, and you see 135 spikes up quite a bit on our Dolly Parton curve, called that for highly scientific reasons, of course. But as common as it is, it's not really talked about compared to, say, xenon-135. And that's because tellurium-135 only has a half-life of about 19 seconds. And even the most conservative radiation protection experts would say after 10 half-lives, something's basically gone. So even during a large early puff release accident scenario, that's not really an isotope of concern. Xenon-135 lasts nine hours, but that one's less of a concern because you're just gonna exhale it because xenon is a noble gas. The more concerning ones are things like cesium-137 and strontium-90 because they have a half-life of 30 years. Those are the main isotopes of concern and what's left after Chernobyl because they've only gone through a little over one half-life since the accident. But yeah, stuff like tellurium, they decay so fast, they're basically the nuclear version of throwing the cotton ball on the manganese up top side. Huge impact and then gone. And that's another reason why staying inside after a nuclear accident or a nuclear bomb going off in the general vicinity, it's a good idea to stay inside for, for three days or so because a lot of the short-lived stuff is going to decay away and radiation hazard is going to be much less than what it initially was. However, this is all, of course, just speculation on my part. Sure. I tried this again using one gram of permanganate, and the same thing happened. It just kind of sat there for a while, and then suddenly popped. <laughs> the hypoxide in the dish did continue to decompose for a bit though, Pop. which I thought was cool. To test this delayed reaction further, I made more heptoxide and I carefully pipetted some of it onto some paper towel. Concentrated sulfuric acid is easily able to tear apart paper towel in seconds, and in doing so, it generates a lot of heat. However, nothing happened here, Same which bubbles. supported my idea that its concentration was just too low. 
Interesting. I initially planned to just indefinitely wait for it to react, but I got impatient and I kept adding more heptoxide. Eventually though, for whatever reason, it just went off and it was much more violent than any of the other runs. <laughs> this was because when I, I guess he said that to avoid jump scaring you. Not unlike obtaining a critical mass in the from the perspective of making a nuclear weapon. You have anything less than that, it's a dud. It's just not going to do anything. But once you get there, it's the prompt neutrons that make the self-sustaining explosive reaction. And that's why going prompt critical is essential to a functioning weapon. Horrible idea for a reactor, and basically impossible under modern reactor conditions. It's the delayed neutrons that make it critical, so it's a controlled reaction versus a bomb. I'd made was a sensitive mixture of a strong oxidizer and a fuel. So when it did decide to react, the entire section so that was covered in the heptoxide did so almost instantly. Yep. Mixing an oxidizer and a fuel like this is the basic recipe for making an explosive, which can obviously be very dangerous. Also, on top of this, unlike other explosive mixtures, the heptoxide ones are both super unstable and unpredictable. With cotton and paper, the yeah. reaction seems to be relatively tame. And even in then, even in, say, designing explosives, the idea is you want it to explode when it needs to, and you want it to not explode when you're not ready for it. <laughs> but with other fuels, things can get really violent Watch and dangerous. Out for, the noise. for example, this guy did it with hexamine, which is commonly used as a camping fuel. It's also a precursor to C4, and I think that might be Ooh. why he tried using it. Dude. In the end, he apparently wasn't okay, injured, good. but I think that adding the heptoxide to fuel is just a recipe for disaster. It's just way too unpredictable, and personally, I don't really think it's worth the potential danger. So far, everything that I've been adding to it has been solid, but I wanted to try it with some liquids. Pretty much any flammable liquid should work, and for the first test, I just did it with acetone. Also, for all these runs, I'm doing the bit more concentrated version, so I'm using one gram of permanganate. <laughs> Poof. The reaction was almost instant, and at 60 frames per second, it oh, only wow. lasted a few frames. For the next one, I did it with 95% ethanol, which was just another solvent that I had on hand. Unsurprisingly, this reaction was also extremely fast, but what I thought was the coolest part was when I slowed it down. I of course was still only able to get a few frames of the reaction, but I thought it kind of looked like a mini nuclear explosion. I mean, it's a mini mushroom cloud and it's just the properties of mushroom clouds are just buoyancy. There's nothing nuclear about this reaction, but I can understand the visual comparison for sure. After playing around with this for a bit and seeing these solvents react and ignite the moment they touch the heptoxide, I started to think about the rocket video that I made. In that video, I talked about hypergolic combinations, which is where a fuel and an oxidizer spontaneously ignite on contact. Mm. That was exactly what was happening here, and I figured the next thing I'd want to try is aniline, which was an old rocket fuel. I really thought this reaction would be a lot more violent, but it seemed to be about the same as the others. However, the major difference was that I felt that it generated a lot more heat. Unfortunately though, after trying this, I ended up having to put the project on hold for a couple months. However, when I came back to it, something weird happened. I decided to redo the runs with adding solvent, and for some reason, the results were different. It was relatively tame before, but this time when I added the acetone, I was surprised by the difference. <laughs> oh, alright. It was a much more violent reaction, and when I did it again, the same thing happened. The sound that each one made also surprised me because I didn't hear anything like that in any of the other ones. The whole thing about everything surprising him, that just shows that it's not a practical thing to work with if it's going to be this unpredictable. One other thing that comes up as far as nuclei that don't want to exist are ones that are in the metastable excited states, such as 
Technetium 99M or Metastable. It's used in medicine and it's useful and it's predictable, but it is kind of like handling something that's unstable in that the clock is always ticking on where it's useful. So you have to just move promptly when using it because after all it'll just dump its energy and drop to a lower energy state when it just isn't as useful. I then tried it with ethanol and it had a much higher pitched and more violent snap to it. Pop. I did this one a second time as well and it still had that nice snap to it. For the last try I did it with aniline and it wasn't as nearly as violent. Okay, more of a sparkler. Like before though, I could just feel that it generated a lot more heat. Because the aniline seemed to be relatively tame, I decided that I would try to fire it in the test tube like I did in my rocket video. So to a test, test tube, tube I carefully added <laughs> some sulfuric acid, followed by a small amount of the permanganate. I figured it was better not to use the full gram like I did in my test runs and to do it a bit more dilute here. This was all thoroughly mixed around, and then I added the aniline. Whoa. It seemed fine, and by that I mean it didn't explode, <laughs> so I tried- <laughs> It seemed fine, and by that I mean it didn't explode. Should put that on a reactor operator turnover sheet. Tried it with a narrowed neck. Ooh, okay. The reaction here was a lot more violent, and it was also pretty loud. The full impact of the sound though, just like in all the other runs, wasn't picked up super well There's by the, the dust mic. Falling again. So a mixture of heptoxide and sulfuric acid, and a fuel like aniline, could potentially work to fire a rocket, but there were just too many downsides to it. Oh, oh yeah, rockets, you want them to go off when you want them to, that's the main one. <laughs> The major one is that the heptoxide is just way too sensitive, yeah. and if it's stored in a tank, it could just explode. <laughs> the decomposition of the heptoxide might also be able to travel up any feed lines. I think there was one quote, I forget who said it, but it was from the early days of rocket experiments in the early 20th century, and I think a good rule of thumb is to always assume the rocket will explode. And make it back to the tank, which would again explode. Also, a huge portion of its mass is basically manganese dioxide, which doesn't really do much for the reaction. Look at that. And not only is it just dead weight, it would probably also get stuck in the rocket engine and start building up, Ugh, which yeah. could cause a bunch of other problems. But anyway, I think that's about It's also highly corrosive too, so you don't want it to mess up your nozzle. About it. Manganese heptoxide is definitely an interesting chemical, and I think it can sometimes be fun to play with, but it's also extremely dangerous. I really don't recommend anyone trying this out for themselves though, I agree. unless they have the proper setup to deal with it. Not only is it super reactive and explosive like we saw, it also shoots dangerous vapor and dust into the air that should definitely not be inhaled. Gotta have your fume. Hug. Also, when you're done playing around with it, you're left with a bunch of manganese waste that has to be dealt with properly. Yeah, you can't just dump it, kinda like dealing with nuclear waste, you have to process it and carefully engineer the disposal and release. In the case of spent fuel, you're going to have it sit in the spent fuel pool for several years and then put it in dry cast storage indefinitely. This means that even after neutralizing it with water, it can't just simply be poured down the drain or dumped into the garbage. In my last video, you guys seemed to like that I showed how I dealt with my waste, so I've decided to do that again. This one has also been posted to my other channel, Nile Blue, and there's a link in the description. Yeah, I'm glad that he shows how he handles waste disposal. That's an important part that's often neglected, because it isn't as sexy as watching explosions, but it is definitely an important part of managing any fuel cycle, nuclear fuel cycles included. I really enjoyed this one. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.